so I'm going to talk about building a resilient organization or network or however you kind of identify as a group that coalesces around watershed issues. Um, and I use the word resilience intentionally because environmental work, we talk so often about environmental resilience so that natural systems that we care about bounce back from change. Um, but that's true for the, for the people that are involved as well, the organizations that were involved as well, that they, you all need to be resilient um, in order to do the work over time. Because often people start working on water issues because of a crisis or concern about a threat to water issues. We heard Beth say earlier that, you know, we sort of wanted to build this coalition, start a coalition around water, but there was nothing really urgent until the big floods in 2011. And then suddenly there was coalescing around this idea. So um, at the beginning, there are there is often a lot of energy to move things forward. You join together for a common goal around a crisis. Um, but most water issues are long term uh, because the issues are complex and they require complex solutions. So whether your organization is a group of people, established nonprofit, government agency, or a network of organizations, it is definitely difficult to maintain momentum over time, especially when their leadership and personnel changes. I'm sure you all can tell me stories about that. Um, so that all comes down to ultimately is relationships and institutional memory. It's a little bit more than that, but we'll talk about that uh, as we go through. So I'm thinking about governance from resilience rather than money per se, although that's certainly part of the part of the equation. Um, and uh, let's get to it. All right. So I've met many of you before my long career. I've been working in conservation for many years. Most of that time, 16 years, was at the Hudson River Estuary Program. Um, at the same time, I was also serving on nonprofit and municipal boards. So I've been doing that for 18 years. And that's where a lot of my experience with governments and organizations comes from. Um, and now I'm a consultant and I specialize in working with environmental conservation groups doing things like planning, community engagement and uh, communication training. So what I really want to talk about today is organizational hygiene. And I call it that on purpose because it's awkward because nobody really wants to talk about it. Um, it's something that you need to do. Sometimes you do part of it and not others, right? So like probably most of us here brush our teeth twice a day, but then there's flossing and there's a fluoride my dentist want me to use. And so, so sometimes that, sometimes that, that happens less often. And sometimes when we're doing this work um, and we're excited about an issue that we're working on together, um, you really wanna spend your time and energy working on it, which is, works really well when you come together to solve a crisis and it's exciting, but if you want to keep working together over the long term, you need to work on your organizational hygiene. So um, there's a great quote from the Watershed Institute in New Jersey that talks about the continual struggle between balancing your energy and time between completing programs and governing the organization or network of organizations or however you're organized. Um, but again, for long term, survival of your organization to address these problems that are long-term, it's really important to focus on those relationships and institutional memory and, 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 and the way that you work together and keeping each other connected and satisfied with the work that you're doing. So you might be wondering why, why do we have to talk about this? I do not want to talk about this because I want to talk about water quality. I want to talk about the tree, the tree planting that we're doing this weekend. I want to do all this. I want to do, do, do. Um, but it really is an important investment uh, in, in this, especially around relationships, because you're more resilient to change because your organization will change over time um, because of changes in personnel, because of loss of funding, because of increases in funding, um, because of pandemics or all sorts of things that happen that we don't know will happen, right? But if you have, if you invest in this part of your work, you're going to be more resilient to change over time. You'll also be better able to achieve your goals if you're working, you're working together more efficiently, more effectively, and you're better able to handle change. And then there's continuity over the long term, right? I know the Quesia Creek Coalition has been around in variety of forms for more than 20 years. And so there's something there, right? There's something there that there's continuity, there's uh, some effort that's been putting forward over time, some, some people are involved. And um, at some point, we need to make sure that there are other people that can carry on the work because all that work that Kelly just described is not going to be done in all of our lifetimes, right? It's gonna take a long time. So we need to pass it on and make sure that we can do that successfully and well. 
So before we get started in the meet, I wanna do some polls because I wanna get a better sense of where you all are coming from. So Emily's gonna throw up some polls about uh, who you are and the kind of work that you do. So there's two questions. The first one is, which category best represents your affiliation, how you identify? So hopefully that's popped up for you guys. Starting to come in. I forgot to add other on that list. Or did I? You didn't forget, but it only let me have 10 categories. So if you, uh, if you are other, please put it in the chat. Yes. There's all sorts of different kinds of folks interested in water. And then, so the second question is, how do you work on watershed issues? So we all have a different role in the system based on our position, based on our interests. Um, so uh, it'd be helpful if you fill that second question out too. So we're about halfway there. Responses coming in. There is no leader right now. Very well distributed across all of these categories. All right, so we're, we are at about 40 and it hasn't increased in a couple of seconds. So I'm gonna say that people are probably done. So let's end the poll and share those results. All right, so it looks like, again, you can see in that first question that um, it is pretty evenly distributed. A, a few more people, a nonprofit, academia or research and state agency some watershed group, but otherwise there's a big spread. So lots of different kinds of organizations, lots of different kinds of roles. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to try to talk about all those at the same time. And then how do you work on watershed issues? Uh, a majority are part of a watershed group um, and also provide advice and guidance and about half provide technical expertise. Some are funders, uh, about a third support implementation and a third partner in other ways. And there's lots of other, um, a few other here as well. So feel free to add to the chat here, um, setting up science, citizen science programs and doing watershed work, right? So as a consultant or business owner, you're gonna be provide some technical specific ex expertise, which is, is great. We have so many resources in the, um, in the Hudson Valley for that. All right, well, thanks guys. I appreciate knowing a little bit more about you. All right, so. When you think about people and organizations and why they participate in groups, this is not something we've talked about yet today um, or this week, because it, but this is an important piece, right? You're not gonna do the work. You're not gonna get people to, attract to be attracted to do the work unless you um, keep them interested or involved somehow. So from this uh, great publication from the Institute for Conservation Leadership, uh, they've identified four ways that people, four reasons why people stay involved in the group. So one, they feel they belong, they are valued, their contributions matter, they feel the benefits for themselves and or their organizations, and they feel like they can make a difference by being involved. Um, they also want to work toward goals they understand, help believe in, and create. So the watershed uh, plans we learned about today certainly are examples of bringing folks together to help create a watershed plan that people can believe in. Um, but there's also these other pieces, like there's how you make decisions and how you carry out the work and what some of the roles are in the organization. And then of course, having adequate resources to stay in the work is, is essential as well. And all of those needs are gonna be different based on the organization, based on the watershed, based on the watershed scale. Um, again, gonna do my best to generalize. All right, so overall, what I wanna talk about today is uh, four things and then some tips. So the first thing I want you to think about is clarifying roles and responsibilities, roles and relationships, excuse me. Um, second is building community connections including internal community and external community, uh, sharing the load, making sure the work is spread around um, more people, 
Uh, and then thinking about how you continually plan for transition, really preparing for change over time. And then we'll end with some tips. So first, um, clarifying roles and relationships. So has anybody, we can use uh, reactions here. Has anybody struggled as part of your organization with not knowing who's responsible for what or not sure if you should jump in at a certain point, um, feeling like that wasn't clear, seeing some thumbs up? Yeah, a few folks. Yeah, that can be a challenge. And, and you know, often when you're working with a group of people who you like, right, and you're excited and you care about them and they care about you, Sometimes you're like, well, we don't need to do that. We don't need to be so formal. We're just a group of folks doing a great job. We all trust each other. We all care about each other. Um, and I know that's true. And also it's really helpful to be clear about who does what, right? Even if, even if it doesn't feel urgent because there's an, there's an impact to not doing it, right? If you want to throw some uh, ideas in the chat about you know, what was the result of when it, had, when it wasn't working for you, um, you weren't sure what to do. What was the impact of that? Did it affect the way you were involved? Did it make you not want to go to the meetings or not want to do your homework or whatever and just focus on the thing that you wanted to do and not make those connections with others? Um, the other thing is part sharing the load as well. Is it, I think it's actually dangerous to think that there's only certain individuals that can play certain roles. So you don't wanna be the only person that can do anything or the only person that can, uh, that knows something about the work because things change, right? People um, get new jobs and move away. People get sick, people retire. Um, sometimes you win the lottery, you move to the Adirondacks, right? There might be a lot of many reasons why people um, move on from organizations. And if that person had all that, uh, knowledge and information and the relationships and knowledge about finances and all that in their head and they go, then what happens? Right? Is that, has this ever happened to anybody in a situation? Is this sound, is this resonating at all? Thumbs up or fine. Anyone have examples? Couple of examples. Great, thanks Charlene, thanks Kate. Um, so what the roles and resp responsibilities are depends on your organization type. It depends on, or if you're a network, it sounds like a lot of these are. Um, examples might be a memorandum of understanding. That would be on the more formal end. If you're, I, I imagine that start the, um, the uh, work in the Upper Hudson probably started with some kind of MOU or relationship before it formalized into a 501c3. Um, if you're a nonprofit board, you can have board job descriptions. Um, you can have volunteer job descriptions. Just literally writing it down and being clear about what people expect from themselves and each other. And if you rely on uh, staff at higher capacity organizations, which I know happens, Ripper Keeper works with groups to do some monitoring, right? There's county agencies that help. Um, they, people move on, right? People get new jobs. So what's going to happen? Where is that information stored? Does everybody have access to it? Um, who is the backup? Who do they need to have? Who, does your other, who do your other volunteers need to have relationships with to, um, to follow up on that work when that person uh, moves on? There's also power dynamics at play, right? There are, when you have groups with, uh, with, um, with more resources or state agencies or funding agencies involved, there's definitely power dynamics there. And that's, that's a reality, you're not gonna get rid of them, but just being aware of what they are and aware of like how you're coming across and what you're saying is an important piece of a coalition kind of, kind of work. And then thinking about how you make decisions, being clear about that and um, making sure others understand and are on board. So next you wanna think about building community connections. And again, that's more, um, that's more uh, external as well as internal. So how are you in relationship with each other? How do you communicate? One of the really challenging things about the, the era of Zoom is that we don't have a lot of small talk anymore, right? And a lot of those social relationships are built in small talk. When you get to the meeting and chatting about how traffic was on the way, on the way getting there. Right, or you're talking about your your 
coffee or your kids or whatever. These, these, are the, these are the ways relationships are built. That's not about water, but that's about people. So how are you in relationship with each other, especially when we're so isolated? Um, is there a clear shared, shared purpose, right? You come together around an issue, but what's your longer term purpose? Does everybody know what that purpose is? Why are you working together? What are everybody's interests in that? Because they might be different. What are some norms about how you interact or give feedback? You know, do you want to, these, some of these are more formal that might happen as you formalize more, but again, making it clear to how people can engage and how they're expected to, to interact with one another can really smooth some of these um, as um, Charlene said, total chaos and toxicity, which can happen sometimes. Um, and then thinking about your, your community, right? Not just the few folks you're working with um, in, your, in your coalition or group, but who do you serve? Who do you represent? How are you in relationship with them? Are you staying connected with concerns of folks from, who are marginalized or historically excluded? Um, are you, as Kelly mentioned, you know, lesson learned, we want to make sure we're including folks who speak Spanish better than they speak English, right? So are we getting the word out in the right way? And are we continuing to listen to them, especially as we formalize and get money um, and get more uh, established? Sometimes those community connections change, um, which goes along with how you're including people and continuing to listen to them, even as things uh, as resources increase. So that part of that is defining organizational culture. So a little bit more about that. that. That's how you make decisions, how you give feedback, how you build trust, how do you support each other and create roles where everybody thrives in. It it's, it's worth it to spend a little time kind of exploring that and deciding what you want so it doesn't emerge in a toxic and chaotic way that you're saying, and even notice it's moving in that direction. Say, hey, we have some agreements here we decided we're gonna to work together this way. And if we're not working together this way, we need to talk about it and fix, fix what's going on so that we can work together more effectively and efficiently. And so sharing the load, um, that gets back to that. Is there one person that's driving this? And there's people that have a lot of energy and there's people that have a lot of talents and can really push things forward. Um, and, those pe and those people are really grateful for them, right? Um, but it, again, it's dangerous to be so reliant on one person that if that person leaves, then the whole thing falls apart. So how can you share information? How can you share the load? If that's happening to you, if you're the person, I've been that person, anyone else been that person that takes on all the work, right? It's exhausting and you burn out and you don't necessarily want to keep doing it. So um, you know, pay attention to that and talk about it, right? And if you're noticing that someone else is doing all the work, how can, you, how can you support them? How can you spread it out? Because not only are you helping that person, but you're also helping the cause. You're helping the watershed, you're helping the work continue uh, longer in the future. Um, one thing that's great about a group of organizations is that your institutional memory is spread across all. So if you're, if you're spreading the work across, if you're spreading that institutional memory um, or that work across uh, all these folks, then you have more people in more places to store information that can, that can, that can bring that back later on. Um, another key thing, especially in nonprofits, is everyone should know something about the finances. Um, has anybody been on a board where only the treasurer knows things? I went to a board a meeting once where they told me, uh, or I was working with a group once where they told me that um, when there's a question about money, they just look at the treasurer and decide what to do based on the expression on his face. Right. There is no independent checking of, of, of what's going on. Like they, they didn't check the numbers themselves. They just were like, what's this guy think? And that's it. So again, that's slightly dangerous because there's lots of ways money can go sideways in organizations and, and making sure you have a baseline financial literacy for your, for your group is, is, is a resilient organization thing to do. Um, I was inspired earlier this week by Rodney's presentations. And uh, so I, I pulled a few things uh, over here. So uh, to this one, um, use your plan to frame the work, right? There's, uh, we, we heard examples of how that works very clearly and very directly um, with Upper Hudson and the Quisaic, but also even how you plan your meetings, how you, how you plan them out and making sure that these issues keep coming up and you're framing them um, around the plan. And if you have a resource only um, 
watershed plan, and some of them are, and they don't deal with the organization, the relationship stuff, you may need another plan. You may need a strategic plan or at least some kind of document because you don't just want to talk about it. You really need to memorialize it. That's what helps with institutional memory, that you um, write it down and let other people know where to find it. And you talk about it from time to time. So everyone has a, sh more, a better shared understanding um, about what's expected and what you need to know. All right, so that's also, again, thinking about a future transition, right? How do you memorialize this? And then if you do that work, how do you keep it relevant over time? So say you have a conversation, you do it, you write it down, and then you don't know where it is, or a bunch of new people come on and they don't know about it. You haven't told them about it. So it's, 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 it's memorializing, but also talking about it and making sure new people who are joining um, learn about it as well. So continually plan for transitions. Um, if you, who has heard of a succession planning process? It's often something you do in um, nonprofit organizations, sometimes businesses, just throw a thumbs up or a yes, if you've heard about this. So um, there's a TV show. <laughs> it is hard to do. So this TV show, right, about the next chosen heir. I haven't actually seen it, but that's what I hear. It's like the next chosen heir. That is not what I'm talking about. Um, it's more about doing things in a way where the organization survives a loss of a key player. So I work with a lot of land conservancies. And so what I like to say to them is your organization is the perpetuity business. Literally what land conservancies do is agree to protect land forever. Like it's literally what the law says. And so as a human, you're not, you just aren't, right? No matter what, you're not gonna live forever, but also, you need to move on. You can't do that work forever. It's going to happen beyond the tenure of your organization. So what can you do all the time to make sure that that happens? So succession planning is a structured process to ensure there's some leadership continuity, especially in key positions, and um, so that you retain and develop knowledge and relationships for the future. And the needs are going to change over time. So these can be as simple as who has the codes? Right, I saw, an, I have an example of, I, better, I guess, looking at the time and I got to hurry, but um, where a, a, an EG left, an only one employee, EG left disgruntled, um, they had a huge database of policies to help other organizations and he had the password, nobody else did. And when he left, all that work was gone. Um, so making sure that you know where the passwords are, they're put in a place where someone else can, you know, in a safe way, knows what they are. Um, where do you have your documents stored? Do you store them in paper? Do you store them electronically offsite? Do we all know where to find them? Um, policies can help with this, especially for a nonprofit organization. Sharing those relationships, you don't wanna be the only person to know a key funder or a key um, uh, agency person that you're working with. You need to make sure that more than one person has that. That's, that's part of resilience. It's part of building institutional memory, which I've mentioned a few times. Um, intentionally recruiting new volunteers or board members or staff for certain skills. Rodney talked about that as well around finances. But you might want to recruit folks that have skills around governance um, or document storage, right? Maybe you need a librarian on staff. And you can also think about what's the most important work to continue if your capacity is reduced for a period of time. So organizations that last a long time um, your level of effort is not going to continue the same throughout. You're going to get, there's going to be a lot of attention, the energy is going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to go up and go down. So what, it, you know, when you're, when you're faced with a change like that, perhaps of a loss of a key person, you know, what is it, you have a conversation, what is it we need to do? Because the answer is not everything, right? Some things might be grant applications, staying connected with one another, making sure you're investing and listening to the community. Maybe it's monitoring. Um, to keep a long-term monitoring set going, or maybe it's community events. You know, I, th these are all different things. It depends on your organization, what you're, what you're working on right then, um, what, your, what your volunteers or staff people have the energy or time to do, but also, you know, how, how do you stay connected? All right, so last with tips. I'll, I'll run through these quickly so we have time for a few questions. All right, so tips for staying together. One is put relationships first. Um, that doesn't always feel like the work. Like I said, you know, you want to do the you want to do the water quality monitoring. You want to fill the grant obligations. 
But ultimately what we're doing is working with people and making sure that they are, they want to do it, right? If you don't have people to do it, um, then you don't, you don't have a relationship, you don't have an organization. So put those relationships first, make that really important. And then make the time to talk about these things, even though it's like talking about brushing your teeth. Um, it's really important. Uh, and I'm sure, again, that many of you could share examples of when this has not gone, um, gone well. Uh, it's important to listen more than you talk, right? That's like a general rule of communication, but making sure that you're, you're, you're hearing people, that you're making space for them so that you, um, you know where people stand, right? So you know what's important to folks. Acknowledge differences in power, difference in interest in being involved and, and like accept it as okay, but just know what they are so that you understand where people are coming from. Have I mentioned developing institutional memory? Like I'm really, that, that's a really big thing for me as I've worked on boards and worked with boards. And then you wanna reflect and adapt. As you're changing over time, you wanna make sure that you're saying, how did this work? Do we need to do something different now? You know, here's what we had for our roles and responsibilities when we were all volunteer, but now we got this big grant, we can hire our first person. And how do we need to change? How do the roles change? What are our expectations um, change? Does that mean that person is doing all of the work? I hope not, because that's not possible because you were exhausted as volunteers. So you need to think about what that means. Okay, what am I keeping? What am I giving away? Um, and then be replaceable. Like, I want you to be awesome. You all are awesome. Um, but if you are not replaceable, that is not good for your organization. It's not good for your watershed. And then be brave. Um, be brave, like admit mistakes, figure out how you can um, do things better uh, and don't feel bad about it, feel good about it. Cause what all you're doing is, is trying to be better for each other and better for the resources. All right, so thank you. I'll stop sharing so we can get to some questions. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, lots of good feedback in the chat. Um, and I know we're coming up on our three o'clock hour. So if you need to leave, please do that. But we're gonna take some of these questions because um, they're, they're very good. So um, question from Larry from the Spark Hill Creek Watershed Alliance. He notes that he finds that volunteers are most interested in working in their own way on their own highest priorities and that no volunteer should be denied this, but it can create a situation where the boat is not being rowed in any particular direction except what the current leader offers, which is very challenging. Any thoughts on yes. this? Um, I'm trying to find the question in the chat here. I mean, yes, that's absolutely true. People want to do what they want to do. And to some extent you have to go with that, but you know, are there in that group, are there, are there leaders who are playing the work versus volunteers who are implementing the work? Um, can you just talk about this and say, you know what, if we're going to do our best work for this watershed and try to achieve as much as we can, it's going to be really helpful if we figure out what's the most important to do and who's going to do it. Um, so I, I like make time to talk about it and actually talk about it. And it's sometimes part of that be brave is it's going to be awkward. Um, but it's going to be awkward for both everybody. Like it's awkward for you, but it's awkward for other folks. It just sort of acknowledge, okay, this is awkward, but we're going to talk about it because that's because we're, if we're here to do best for the watershed. And if you want to do best for the watershed, then you need to deal with these, these difficult issues. And I, I'm right now I'm talking about slightly awkward, right? Like things can get escalated and be really awkward and that's a different talk. But just when you're, you know, everyone's trying to go in their own way, like, okay, how are we gonna, how are we gonna coordinate and move on in the same direction? And I'll just comment that I think it's so critical to have those uncomfortable conversations when there isn't something wrong, which is something that Karen said. And oftentimes people feel like, oh, something must be wrong if we're talking about this. And no, that's mm -hmm. not true. It's just, let's keep these gears moving in a, in a way that's as efficient as possible and normalizing that. That is such an important point because then when a challenge arises, you are better gonna, you will better be able to handle it. Uh, because you have those conversations and you know where folks stand and you know who can, you can rely on and that you, um, yeah, because th things are going to happen, challenges are going to happen, but if you are prepared for it and you have those relationships built up, it's just going to be that much easier to have the difficult conversations when they're really difficult. Exactly. Um, how do you navigate conflicting interests or personalities when attending to your organization's continuity? Well, first of all, acknowledge that 
that's okay, right? People are going to have different interests in the work. Um, you cannot expect that people are going to do the same thing for the same reasons that you do them. Um, so there's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, personalities also, like obviously you're not all going to have the same personality. Um, what what you need to do is is kind of come to an understanding, kind of a learning mindset around that, where you are accepting of that. Um, and recognizing that you are not the most important person in the organization because you are a collective, like you work together. So everybody's views are important. Everyone's personality is important and don't like come to it with that generosity of community and generosity of spirit. Um, not everybody does. We all know those folks who aren't, but that's, that's kind of mindset you should try to cultivate in yourself and in your organization, right? So if you think about these cultural aspects and talk about it and what you expect, that helps set the stage. So, you know, so much of what we do is, well, let's hope this happens, right? Whether it's certain kind, you know, we do some education, we hope that people plant trees. We have a group of people together, we try to be nice and we hope that that means that everyone's gonna be nice to each other and that we're gonna work together productively. Well, it helps a lot if you talk about it and be intentional about it and make sure that you are clear about what you expect and what you want from the relationships. Great, thank you. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit, believe it or not, talk a little bit more about institutional memory and perhaps define that, that term as well. Um, the question is about balancing institutional memory and being responsive to new member input and finding that balance. Oh, great question. By institutional memory, I don't mean that the way we did things 15 or 20 years ago are, is the right way to do it. It just means we know what happened, we learned from it. Or um, I was working with a group uh, just this summer on a strategic plan, uh, Land Conservancy, and I asked, well, do you have this policy? Do you have that policy? And they said, and the, and the chair said, yes, yes, yes. And the other board, I said, other board merged, do you know where it is? Have you seen it? They're like, no. So do you, um, if you do if you do something and you don't tell your other uh, group members that you've done it, have you actually done anything at all? So just making sure you, you document it and know where it is, it doesn't mean you can't let it go. Something else Rodney said this week is, how do you, oh, where did I write it down? Um, how do you make space for letting things go and let new ideas in? Like that is a really important part of this learning and growing and becoming a better group of people. Um, and you still should know what happened before because you don't wanna recreate the wheel every time. You know, sometimes when there's a crisis, there's a policy that can help you make decisions. Where did that policy go? I think we approved it in 2014 and what file is it? In? You know, um, making sure you know where things are so you can look at it and say, oh great, this is exactly what we need or like, oh, well, that's not the right thing. We need to update this policy because the situation, uh, it didn't handle the situation we thought it would, right? So it's not about, doing things the same way. It's just about knowing what happened so you can learn and grow from it. Great. Um, you know, in terms of roles and relationships, uh, a lot of our groups have a mixture of different types of people with different limitations. Um, so the question is, what do you do when you have a group that consists of a mixture of representatives from different stakeholders, but under the auspices of a government organization? The government organization has restrictions on what it can do, or if there is a grant, then the granting agency has the lead on certain limitations or executive decisions, which I think is a really important point to make. All right, I found the question because I'm going to need to read it too. That's a great question and complex, and I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so you often have groups that have a different, uh, it sounds like, you know, we remember we didn't have one kind of person dominating even who's here today. Um, You can still work on culture, right? You can still talk about how you relate to one another. Um, sometimes, you know, I work with groups where the relationships are foundational to the success. And then the big grant that they got doesn't make room for making time for that. So one thing, funding agencies, if you're still on, you can think like, oh, relationships are key to this. I should make sure there's enough time and money to spend time talking to each other and talking to the community. Like I want to invest more in that. So that's one thing that can happen. So the folks that in that realm. Um, yeah, there's, there's limitations, right? You're not going to be able to do whatever you want. Um, sometimes there's limitations on how you can be more formal about this. So just like some of this, uh, the relationship building happens between 
meetings, you know, driving somewhere together or getting there early so you can have a quick chat beforehand, just make sure you make space for that somehow so that you're building the relationships you need to build. And this is, you know, if your leader isn't doing it, there's leading, there's leading as a, as a, a follow the leader, what I'm not saying that right, but you know, it doesn't matter what role you have in the organization, you can start to build relationships to help make the organization more resilient long-term. I hope that's yeah, and I'm gonna, satisfying. I'm gonna add to that because <laughs> I know that that question came in during your section on uh, defining roles. And I think in that case, it's even more important to define those roles so that everyone knows what the limitations are on the government agencies and everyone knows what the limitations are on the funding. So you're not going around asking, well, why aren't they doing this? Or, well, they can't, it's, it's not allowed. And so I think that's gonna help move things forward in this collaborative process as well, being really clear and documenting what the, what the what they should be doing, but also if there's certain roles that they really can't be playing. That is an excellent point. And one of the benefits of having a coalition is that you have different roles. I mean, it may seem like the power dynamics work a certain way when groups have resources or less resources, but there's also sometimes more freedom, more ability to do different kinds of things that might be necessary for the work. So understanding, understanding that is an excellent point, Emily, thank you for raising it. Um, and, and Karen, and I know we're over time, but thanks to the 44 of you who are sticking with us because we're, we're recording this. And I think based on what's in the chat, you know, people are getting a lot out of this. So I'm gonna just keep rolling a little bit longer. Um, what do you do in a group that largely consists of volunteers that have different levels of capacity or capacity that changes at different times? And this is something that Karen, you and I talked about in getting ready for this talk. So wondering if you could talk a little bit about all volunteer organizations. Um, I mean, I'd still do this, right? Um, you'd still, you still want to have conversations about it. You still want to talk about it. Um, don't just assume because they're volunteers that the, you, they can only do what they want to do. I mean, obviously, what was that first thing on the list? You know, people have to feel like their interests matter and they're part of the group, you know, not strong arming, but just to have a conversation and say, hey, we're working together on this thing. What do we need to do best to work on this thing? And how do we need to show up for each other, for ourselves, in order to make progress on this thing? So just because you're a less formal group doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about it. And if I said anything um, insightful before, Emily, you can share it now. I think that that's right. And it, the the ways that you do things might not be as, you know, technologically advanced as perhaps some bigger organizations, but there's still opportunities to go through these things and, um, and have them on hand. Um, I'm wondering if you could also talk a little bit about leadership. So last year at our annual watershed conference, we had a, a session on shared leadership in particular. And the question is about um, when is it a we, when should we think about temporary leaders or how we lead um, and thinking about how these collaborative processes work and, and perhaps some hierarchy around um, leadership. A tough question and also tough to answer given the different kinds of groups and different dynamics that go on. Um, I think that um, it's good to have a leader full organizations, right? That have a, many leaders that people feel empowered to um, represent the organization um, and that's part of sharing the load, right? Making sure that folks know what's going on. Um, but again, clarifying roles and responsibilities is really key and making sure you're sharing that power. So you don't necessarily want the same chair for 20 years, right? How are you cultivating leadership and others to make sure that work is carried on beyond your tenure with the organization um, or should anything happen for any, any reason? Um, is the question written down? That's gonna be help me to look at it. Was at it was a private message to me, so. Um, oh. <laughs> but I'll, I'll add to that and say, um, you know, Karen and I are both senior fellows of the Environmental Leadership Program. And one of the things that we've learned in that program is that leadership comes in a variety of different forms. There's many, many different ways to lead. And so some of the things that you may think of as, um, when you think of a leader in your head, uh, maybe it's a politician or maybe it's a, you know, a, a leader of a, 
there's all different types of leadership, right? Um, but there are ways to lead in a variety of ways that takes advantage of lots of people's different skills, skill sets and strengths. And so I think it's really important to look across your organization and see where you have leadership in ways that you may not be thinking of it currently. And that might also be an opportunity to build your group capacity and define those roles and make sure that people are, are leading in areas where they're particularly strong. Right. And then recruiting, right? If you're, if you're finding, if you assess that and say, Hey, you know what, we need somebody who's stronger in finances, or we need someone who's stronger on communication or, or governance, like seek those folks out might be, you know, we're not just going to the community college and looking at the environmental studies program. Maybe we're looking at the business program. Maybe we're looking at the um, communications programs, right? Because we we're looking for different kinds of skills. 